Welcome to the Monday Motivational Call. No contact like a motherfucking boss. Oh, God, I'm excited to do this call. And here's why, ladies. Because what I've learned in my experience and in all of my training and coaching clients around the world is that our fears of leaving that relationship are nothing but bullshit. But we're talking about a narcissistic relationship. So we're kind of talking about something that's quote unquote special. So that's what I want to talk about tonight is like the fears that keep us stuck in these relationships, right? With these narcissists. We believe we're believing their lies. We're believing the bullshit. We're believing the messages that they're giving us. Maybe, you know, not a direct message, but like a hidden message behind what they're saying. Anyways, that's what we're talking about tonight. And I want to talk about the no contact and the contact and what kind of relationship can you have with a narcissist? Um, you know, cause like if you have little kids and this and that, so we're going to talk about all that. Okay. Well, first let's get to the call. All right. So no contact like a MF boss. I don't know how I came up with this, but I must've saw it somewhere or must've, um, saw something like that and, and, and thought, Hmm, that sounds like a good call. <laughs> Let's talk about it. So I am Denise Dominguez. I am so excited to be here with you today, tonight, actually. And I want to tell you a little bit about me. I'm a speaker, coach, and bestselling author. And my most recent book was released last October, and it was called A New Day Dawns, Breaking Up with Abuse. I hosted a podcast called It's Your Turn for two years on Blog Talk. And what I do is I help women heal their emotional wounds all over the world. How's it get any better than that? So that they can live a life of freedom, joy, and abundance. I do this by having them embrace and connect with who they really are so that she can begin to experience healthy relationships, a fulfilling life, and more money in her business. Or even just more money in her wallet. More money. Okay, so this call is just for you. So let's make yourself a priority for the next 30 to 40 minutes, okay? That means close out all the other tabs, especially Facebook. Um, put your cell phone on silent and just be here with me. And do you. This is about you. This is about you soaking up as much knowledge as possible because if you're on this call, then you are or were in a relationship with a narcissist. And we know that that is a whole special kind of everything. So hopefully you're in a relaxing place, right? To listen to the call. And I call it my sacred place. It's a place where it, it's right over there. I'm looking at it. It's just like, it's just a calming space in my house for me, only me. I have my little Buddha over there and I have my energy board there and it's just my place to do me. So when I do these calls, I'm thinking of me and how I can um, have the best place in my house to just focus on me. So I call it my sacred place. All right, so hopefully you're in a space like that and you have some kind of a drink next to you. I always have water, um, but you have whatever you want. So let's take a couple of deep breaths and just be here in the present moment, okay? I'm gonna shout the video for me. And as we breathe in, I want you to think about um, Breathing in all of the love and all of who you are. And as you exhale, I want you to exhale all of the crap from today, okay? Just let it all go. It doesn't even matter. It was probably bullshit anyways. <laughs> so, 
So ready? We're gonna do this four times, so ready? Breathe in. Hold it for a second. <sighs> Exhale all the crap. Okay, I already feel better. All right, let's do this again. Ready? You're gonna breathe in all the love, positivity, all the light. Hold it. Sip if you can. <sighs> Let out all of the negativity, all of the crap. All right. Let's do this again. Ready? Breathe in. All the love, all the light, all the positivity, everything that you truly are. <sighs> Exhale. Everything that you don't want. Everything that doesn't serve you. All right, last time. Breathe in. Hold it. Try to sip in. A little bit more. <laughs> Let it out. Uh, that right there in itself is just so relaxing to me that I, I just, <laughs> it's like awesome. Okay, so tonight's call, we are talking about our fears, right? Because, I mean, we're specifically talking about fears tonight that keeps us in a toxic relationship. But listen, fear is fear. So it could be about your job or it could be about whatever. It doesn't matter. Fear is fear, okay? Fears, um, how they keep us playing it small and like I said, that includes staying in a toxic relationship because we think something bad or horrible is going to happen if we leave, right? You know why? Because we're listening to the crap that is being fed to us. And really what it boils down to is a choice, right? We choose to take that in as a truth, right? What's being told to us. I know I did for many, many, many years. I mean, he would just say something like, if you leave, um, all your shit's going to be on the, this was, this was a big one that he would say, all your shit's going to be on the front lawn in flames. You know, he had to be dramatic. So it was always something that he would say. And then I would vision what he was saying. All my stuff that I own was going to be on the front lawn. Well, guess what, ladies, if you're in that bad of a relationship, who gives a crap about your clothes? But I get it. Like I was there too. So I understand how being really fearful and scared of what he might do, because you also go into a whole story about, um, well, if he'll do that, what else would he do? Right. I get it. Right. So you have to, you know, really know that what, first of all, what he's saying to you is just his way of keeping you. That's his way to keep you in his safe spot because abusers have to have somebody to abuse. If they don't have somebody to abuse, then what are they going to do? Right? Talk about out of control, right? They have to have somebody there. So they want to keep you so that they can have somebody, you know, so to speak to beat up on. Not to say that there isn't relationships with narcissists that don't get physical because there are, but um, metaphorically. So, so here's what I'm saying. All right. I know for me, I stayed for so many years because I believed what he was saying that if I left, you know, he, that was one of them, put my crap on the front lawn. The other one was somehow, some way I knew that if I left, I would be financially on my own. Okay, so most men, when there is a breakup and there's children involved and you own properties or you have a business together, you go to a lawyer and it gets, you know, split. And most men want their wives or ex-wives and their children to live comfortably, right? This is sometimes this happens. I've never experienced it. <laughs> I've seen it. Yeah. It does happen. And so, you know, my, and I knew that that was not the case for me. I knew that if I left, I had to take what I could take. And I knew that was, that was it. 
So this was another fear of mine. How was I going to make it on my own? Where was I going to live? You know, all of those things came into play because I ran his business. I, I don't have a college degree um, and I don't have a career, right? Because I work for his business and I was a stay-at-home mom. So when you, when you do that, you think in your head, well, uh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do for money? What kind of job am I going to get? You know, 15, 16, $20 an hour is not going to cut it to make it on my own. You have to make more, especially I was in South Florida where it's extremely expensive. So these are all the stories that were running in my head that kept me in my fear and kept me in that toxic relationship. Because here's the thing, a dysfunctional comfort zone is still a comfort zone, right? I knew my dysfunction. I knew how to handle it. I knew, I just knew. And believe it or not, it was more, it was scarier for me to think about leaving that craziness than to stay because at least if I was there and I stayed, I had a roof over my head, food on the table, bills were paid, my kids were taken care of, I had a car, I had gas in my car, blah, 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 right? Okay, but who was I sacrificing while thinking bills were paid for, right? Who, who's, who was losing out on that? Me and my children. Because as I stayed in that, and you know that this goes across the board, as we stay in these relationships like this, we suffer. The kids suffer. And it doesn't serve anybody. So what keeps us there is that fear and what he is saying to us, whether he's point blank saying it, or if he's, you know, throwing you little messages like, you know, or some body language or whatever. But here's the thing. Fear is just false evidence appearing real. That's all it is. Because here's what I know. As crazy as my story got, and it got pretty fucking crazy, when I left, All that behavior stopped. All of that behavior stopped. And my, and my daughter even told me, she was like, mom, it's been two and a half years. And, you know, it, it was kind of like a two and a half year time period where her dad would do something crazy, right? And the two and a half years passed. And another two and a half years passed. And nothing. So here's, here's the <laughs> point of what I'm getting to. Is that... Because we choose or chose to believe the stories that were being told to us and we chose to stay in fear and we chose to stay in those relationships for X amount of time, I now know through my experience, through my client's experience and all over that it's not true. It's total bullshit. That you have to think about yourself and you have to think about what's healthy for you mentally, emotionally, and physically. And, and like, I, like I said before, if you're in an abusive, physically abusive relationship with a narcissist, um, definitely take the threats seriously, but at the same time, still get out. Make a plan to get out. Reach out to somebody. I mean, there's so many resources out there. Um, reach out to somebody that you can trust or go to a place or, hey, lie. Lie and say you're going to the kid's school for a school meeting or whatever. Do whatever you need to do. I mean, there's always a way for you to get out. Um, but I know that the majority, if not all, of why women stay in these relationships is, is fear. Fear of what they think that person is going to do. So I want to read you a post that my client actually posted the other day. Um, so this will be a quote from her. And... When she posted this, um, it just really, I was like, can I copy and paste this and put it on my call? Because it really resonated with me and it's going to confirm that our fears are nothing but bullshit. So here's what she said. She said, something I was scared to do was ask the narcissist in my life to leave. I couldn't tell him why. All I knew was that I had to get out. I I scared, I was scared physically and emotionally. 
there were so many vile threats and I knew what he was physically capable of. I did everything I could not to poke the bear, so to speak. Now I see most of my fears were unfounded. His threats were due to loss of control over me and I was already ahead of the game. I just didn't know it. My life is so much better now. My kids and I are happier. I was scared they would hate me, and they did for a little while until they realized what he was all about. She goes on to say that it took me months to realize that every time I had contact with him, I would suffer. The best part of having the The best part of having contact was that as I grew stronger and wanted to get things off my chest, he would come right over. There was a couple of times he didn't know what hit him. The last time I had contact was a week or two after my son's birthday when I really let him have it with all my anger I had inside. He asked me if I was feeling better and quote unquote, are you still mad at yourself? You see the manipulation that they have or try to spew onto us? She goes on to say that I let him have it one more time and refuse any more contact. I went through such a period of fear that even seeing a vehicle that resembled his would send a jolt through me. I had to say, it's just a trick. To myself, every time I met one, until that fear went away. After all of this, when I met him on the road, which is seldom because the universe looks after me and keeps me out of his path, I wish him well and drive on. No control over me equals no fear. Holy crap, isn't that great? Isn't that beautiful? So that's what we're talking about tonight is that there's so many stories in our heads that whether they came directly from the nar- narcissist or if it was passed down, you know, and it was like already a garden and then he grew even more in it, whatever, wherever the fears came from, it's false evidence appearing real. And that when, yes, when they lose control over you, there is going to be a certain control that he's going to want back or try to get back. But you have to stand your ground and you have to take control that you are not going to have any contact with this person. So like she was saying in the, in the, in the post that every time she had contact with him, okay, the only relationship that you can have with a narcissist is no, no relationship at all. I mean, that's the truth. Now, if you have kids that you have to have some sort of contact because of the kids, um, what I would highly recommend is for you to keep the contact through like emails or texts and not seeing each other and not talking to each other, like as minimal as possible, right? Um, And maybe an email would be good for that. I'm fortunate enough in my situation, that when I left Florida and I left him, that I have had no contact with him, no contact with him since 2012. And even there was a few times when I did try to contact him just for legal stuff, trying to, when I was divorcing and getting all that stuff, that he wouldn't respond. Thank you. Um, and then most, <laughs> and then most recently, um, something about her son. Cause now I was like, okay, it's been five years or over five years, whatever. Like it's time that we could kind of co-parent, you know, here's what I'm thinking. Uh, and our son is going through some stuff and I thought, Hey, this would be a great opportunity for us to be on the same page and parent our son. Right. And, uh, so I had, um, I think I, yeah, I text him to see if we could be on the same page when it came to our son and kind of come together and, and parent. And through my daughter, um, I was told that he's just not ready to talk to me yet. Okay, well, get fucking over it, okay? I mean, really? 
But anyway, the point is, is that the only kind of relationship that you can have with a narcissist is no relationship at all. And that going no contact is what's best for you, right? Because when you come out of a relationship like that, you need time to not only separate yourself from that environment, that energy, but to take some time for you to start focusing on you and heal you. Because this was an abusive relationship. No matter which way you slice it, you were in an abusive relationship. And when you come out of an abusive relationship, you have to heal from that relationship, okay? And I say that because I know for me, that truth was hard for me to take in. That I was in an abusive relationship, that I was an abused woman. That was really hard for me to take in, in the beginning. Um, and it took a while for me to adjust to that because I always viewed myself as strong and a warrior and like I had been through the freaking ringer and I came out of it. I survived it. So I did not think of myself as an abused person at all. In fact, when I would hear abuse or abusive woman, the vision that came to my mind was, um, you know, those posters that you see sometimes in a public bathroom where the girl is like in a fetal position and her makeup's all smeared and she's crying and she's got a black eye. And that vision was an abusive woman to me. Not me. Mm. Right? I don't have black eyes. I'm not in a fetal position. But guess what? Abuse comes in many forms. And just because I don't have a black eye doesn't mean that there's not internal wounds going on. Right? So you, that was a, like I said, that was a hard pill for me to swallow, but the truth shall set you free. And so, <laughs> yes, the truth hurts, but yes, the truth shall set you free. So once I did embrace the truth, because that is my truth, then I could move past it, move forward, and heal from that, right? So now, you know, yeah, I was in an abusive relationship. This is the truth. And now I'm able to help other women that are going through the same thing or have gone through the same thing. And I have women coming to me, here's another thing, that were in an abusive relationship or marriage 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And they've since moved on. They're in a happy marriage now. They have a great guy in their life and everything is just great. And when I ask them who triggers them, the first person that they say is their ex. Because if you don't heal from these relationships, it's always going to be like a sitting duck. It's always going to be a heavy energy inside of you. It's always going to be an open wound, right? So you have to really mm -hmm. take that time away for you to be focusing on you, loving you, healing you, and those wounds from these relationships. I highly recommend you don't wait 20 and 30 years. Um, the <laughs> best thing to do would be like right when you get out of it. And, and I know in the beginning it's pretty raw because like I'm writing my book right now and I was just writing this today that when I, when I came here from my abusive relationship, I was a wild child. <laughs> I was, yeah, it's in the book, but I was partying and I was, just doing things that were not loving me. Healthy. Yeah. Not taking care of me. I mean, I had, I mean, I even write that like I, I wasn't like, uh, I was self-destructing really. Um, I wasn't taking care of me at all because I felt at that time that I had been let out of prison and I felt like this free, I can do whatever the fuck I want. And I did. You're not going to be bossing me. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, and it was kind of like I had to get that out of my system because then it wasn't long. Like I, I had, don't get me wrong, I had boundaries, but my boundaries were pretty loose compared to what I normally, you know, because as a mom, my first thought is, you know, setting a, a good example for my kids, right? Which my daughter was the only one who was here with me in North Carolina. But that's my main priority is to set a good example for my kids. So meaning not getting drunk in front of them, 
uh, which I did, um, and not bringing, you know, men around, which I did. So those are the things that, you know, just a glimpse of what I was doing that wasn't serving me. Like when you love yourself, you respect yourself and you have boundaries with other people and yourself, there's certain things that you will do and not do. And that's one of them. Like numbing yourself because you don't, or you can't deal with what's happened to you. Like that's a clear red flag. That's a sign that you need to take a step back and go in and take care of you. Because numbing yourself is only going to give you a big headache the next morning. and It's not going to make anything better. It's just going to continue to manifest itself. So, um, you know, I was, this, I was this fear. Fear was there again. I was scared of the truth. I was scared to face what really happened because really, you know what really happened, right? Because you can deny that I was in an abusive relationship, that you were in an abusive relationship, but to the core of who you are, you know what really happened. So here's, here's what I wanted to say to you is that don't believe the lies, right? Don't believe his lies. And don't believe your lies because mm. we tell ourselves stories that are total bullshit. And what he is telling <laughs> us is total bullshit, right? Yeah. And what society says is total bullshit. Cause think about that poster I was talking about in the bathroom. If, if they would, and I get like domestic violence, like, such great awareness around it. I'm, I'm so thankful for that. And that's great. But what if they would say like, or have different types of pictures or have a different form of that poster and say abuse comes in many forms. And this is just one of them, right? Because abuse is abuse. That picture just amplifies like a physical abusive relationship, a woman who's been physically abused, but there is other abuses. And I call it the silent abuse because when you're being abused by a narcissist, you can't call the cops and say he's a controlling, manipulative asshole. Come and arrest him. You can't, right? You can't say, <laughs> you can't call the cops and say he's holding all the money and I can't even go grocery shopping to feed my kids. And I work for his business and I have no control over the account. You can't call the cops and say that. So I call it the silent abuse because who are you going to turn to? Who are you going to, you know, there's no awareness for that. So, uh, you, th those are actual true stories that I went through. I would, I would literally go to the store. This was when people still wrote out checks. <laughs> I wrote out checks to go to the grocery store because when I would use my debit card, you know, it takes the money out right away. And when he would be threatening to hold the money or he would say there's no money in the account in the account and we wouldn't talk for weeks and weeks at a time, then I would go and write a check for the groceries because we had to have food because the check took longer to go for the process to go through the bank account than my debit card did. Yeah. So I would do what I had to do to feed the kids and myself. And so I'd write a check. So here we are already 30 minutes into the call. Um, and I want to give everybody a chance to ask me questions or whatever, <laughs> whatever's on your mind. So um, do you have any questions? It's just me and you, Michelle, so far. I know. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt and it was like, oh, shush. <laughs> Just me and you. So Just guess me what? And you. You, you get some okay. private coaching then. <laughs> I, I was thinking that going, oh my gosh, hey. <laughs> Take advantage. Right? I love, um, and I didn't really think about it. And I could totally relate to your, you know, when you left you know, and I, and I made the comment of you ain't the boss of me no more, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, yeah, I, I did the same things. And, um, 
things that probably weren't the healthiest and, and stuff because I was like, <clears throat> I'm finding myself again and my identity and yeah, you ain't busting me no more. <laughs> hey, that's um, a good title for another call. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't really think about it of, you know, how so the triggers, I don't have to deal with my ex-husband a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Um, especially now that my son is 21. Mm-hmm. So I don't have to deal with him, but he'll always be, yeah. He'll always still be a part of my life just because we do have our son together. So once he starts, you know, talking about marriage and having grandkids and stuff like that, but it took his second ex-wife for him to really understand um, being an abusive husband, I think. Really? Because I think so. Because she had to, she came out of an abusive marriage and so he got to see firsthand what she had gone through as far mm-hmm. as having to deal with that with her kids, with her husband. And right. after that, now our relationship really changed. Wow. So, yeah. So I don't really have any triggers. Every now and then I, I might of oh, that's so your dad, but I can't say nothing. <laughs> he's still your dad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So yeah. Um, but I, I think too, that it helps to have that, um, distance. Oh yes. From someone. Yeah. You know, um, like with us, you know, talking that it was two years ago and stuff like that. And it took five years. I mean, it took until this summer for me to finally completely cut ties from the 10 year relationship I had been in before where I realized now it's still just all about you Mm -hmm. and what everyone can do for you. And And that'll never change. And, and that won't ever change now. So, um, I've really, yeah, I've really, since this summer, saw a lot of that and I'm really starting to see and read people and going off of my gut instinct. If if it doesn't feel good, it's not going to be good. <laughs> That's right. That's awesome. Because so now um, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say because that that's who you really are is you trust yourself. But we've been trained we've been programmed we've been rewired to not trust ourselves so now we kind of go got to go back into the beginning (laughs) who we really are right um and, and that's very true too because then it's like okay maybe i'm reading into this too much Mm -hmm. and i i need to have trust but if, yeah, if it doesn't feel good, I'm like, mm. so then I, it, a different side of my personality comes out. In me. It's that I'm light, heavy feeling. If it's light mm-hmm. and, and you feel like, Ooh, or that's awesome. Or you literally feel light in your body, then you know, that's true for you, whatever that is. Um, if it's an opportunity that it, that comes up or whatever, then that's your truth. And like you're describing, if it feels heavy, then listen to that because that's a lie. And you want to listen to both so you know and trust that when I feel something light, that that is the truth. And when I feel this heaviness, that that is a lie. And trust that they're both correct because they always are. I love that analogy and that's a great one. Yeah. Yeah. It's about getting out of this and connecting with the heart. That's Mm -hmm. if we would just slow things down and just listen to what our heart is telling us versus what stories and all the stuff that's in here is telling us this, like we'd be rocking. Right. And sometimes though our heart can get in the way as well. So um, I used to teach a class And we would do the, you know, the pros and cons, you could call it pros and cons, or you could call it your head and your heart, you know, 
Mm-hmm. What, what is your head saying? What is your heart saying? But then do a gut check mm-hmm. and go with what your gut tells you, because that's going to be the truth of what's going on between the two. Right. And Every time. Not even, yeah. And it might not even be the two. Maybe your gut comes back and says, Hey, what about this? Mm-hmm. You didn't think about this. You you're doing this and you're doing this, but now what about what's in the middle between them? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's so we're energy beings and we need to listen to what feeling comes into our bodies because that's our energy. That's that is the universe. That is, you know, whatever you want to verbalize it as, but that is who you really are. And it's so the perfect analogy that I that I have is I was on the phone with a woman and she she has a three year old and we were talking about trust and she said oh my gosh I just did that the other day so she was at the store with her son and she told him to pick there was like a thing of lollipops with different flavors you know watermelon grape whatever and she told him to pick one well he immediately picked up one that he wanted and he said this one and she said are you sure are you sure you don't want this one? Are you sure you don't want this one? That's where the reprogramming came in. When we were so young, he knew which mm-hmm. one he wanted. He picked it up right away. And she is the one who put that in his head. Are you sure? She put the doubt in his head at such a young age, right? This is how we right. were programmed to not trust ourselves. And at the end of the, the, what she was telling me at the end of the conversation, she said he ended up keeping the one that he wanted. Good for him. But that's just a great example of when we're young and, and she felt really bad. So again, I'm not blaming or shaming our parents, right? Because even this mom, she was just trying to, you know, I did it. You did it. Our parents did it. We just want to make sure that they get the right one. We don't know what we're actually doing. Our parents didn't know what they were doing to us. And this was put right. on them. So they were programmed the same exact way. And that's why we say, like, we're not shaming or blaming anybody. This is just what was taught to them. And then they passed it to us. And then we passed it to our kids. But now we're stopping it, right? Because now we know better. And when you know better, you do better. So I just love that. Um, story because it really kind of puts in perspective of at such a young age what is taught to us and that's the programming that I'm talking about how to not trust yeah yeah or not forgive or what if (laughs) yeah yeah and the and and I mean we're just trained to not forgive not trust and not love ourselves but we were born to do all of those three things. We were born with the capability of trusting ourselves, of loving ourselves, and of forgiving not only ourselves, but other people. I mean, Mm -hmm. um, I had uh, two three-year-olds and the one three-year-old threw the remote at the other twins and threw the other one at his brother. And the kid had like a knot on his head. And I was like, oh my God. And I was like, ready to like, (laughs) your brother, I can't believe he did that. And I'm like, I'm, I'm feeling, you know, like anger inside of me. And I'm looking at him. He's just like, (laughs) what did I do? Yeah. I'm like, aren't you mad at your brother? (laughs) Like, I didn't say that, but he's just like, cool with it. He's cool with his brother. He's like nothing. And I'm like, holy crap. Okay, well, if you're not going to hold it, a grudge, neither am I. (laughs) But (laughs) just another example of how we really are. We're we're forgiving, right? Because it, I wasn't in the room. It probably was an accident. You know, who cares? It doesn't matter because I didn't get hit in the head. But we go into like when things happen to us like that, right? When people hurt us for whatever reason we go into that anger and I'm going to get you back and how dare you or even stupid minute things right because as girls we could be so catty and so and so said something and blah blah and whatever um Mm -hmm. and, and we hold on to that and we get into that and that's just another form of us being trained 
and programmed to be like that, right? And it doesn't serve us because ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not me. I do not have time to be catty. So, uh, any questions? Any more questions or any comments or anything that you want to say or ask? Well, I was going to say, you know, we do learn that at a young age, that one picture where I'm shaving my um, grandpa, my great grandfather and stuff like that. I was already, I was afraid. I was afraid to shave him. I was afraid I was going to hurt him. And because then, that was put on you. Right. Well, and he, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure I wasn't, obviously they wouldn't have done that, you know, allowed me to do it and stuff like that. But he was always so ornery and stuff that it's like, and I remember him, you know, I just would start to get that razor to his cheek and then he'd go, girl, at me. <laughs> <We're crying. laughs> okay, well now what? <laughs> he was scared. He was like, crap, my face is going to be split open. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember him doing that. And then finally he stopped long enough and, and then it was like, okay, we got this. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and so that picture is so precious in so many ways, because what I see is you, that little girl being so confident in doing that. You look very confident in doing that. You look like, I got this. This is, this is okay. You know, <laughs> which I was hoping I was going to find that one, because when you said that, I'm like, that was the picture that popped in my head, but I had no oh. idea how old I was. Right. And, um, so I know I was around three and a half because the date on the back when it was processed in January of 76. Ah. So that's the only reason I knew how old I was. <laughs> Sweet. Sweet. So yeah. So there you go. How does it get any better than that? Awesome. Okay. Right. It, that's why I have, that's why we do that exercise because it's really important for us to see that little girl in a picture. To really mm -hmm. connect with that little girl and to look into her eyes and just to really like, okay, that is who I really am. That little girl, that confident, loving, forgiving, trusting little girl. That's me. And what do I need to do to get back to that? Because I want to be, I am that. And I want to, you know, be that every day. I want to operate my energy from that knowing. So that picture is important because we have to, you know, really give that little girl a voice and acknowledge her and love her because she deserves it and not push her down and ignore her and focus on all the adult stuff and not give her the attention that she needs, especially if she didn't get it then. Right? That's just what's so important. So, mm -hmm. all right. Are we good? I think so. I'm a little okay. tired, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know how to get in touch with me if you need me. All right, everybody, thank you for joining the Monday Motivational Call. And I will see you next Monday. Now, next Monday's call is, um, wait, what's next Monday? Yeah um the 24th break free from the death grip of abuse or something like that i don't know i see like articles or titles and i'm like oh i like that and i just make a call off of it so <laughs> so um that will be our last um call for october where i'm going to be talking about more on the abusive relationship side and then as we go into november i'm going to be talking about different things um, but of course, always it, it, you know, you can always find these, um, narcissistic calls and how to deal with them and all of that on my YouTube channel. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Michelle, for being here on live. Cause I love the energy when there's somebody here with me. It just, it's different. Makes it it's easier. awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right, everybody until next Monday, I will see you then and have a great week. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.